Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to the newspapers this morning and see what major stories we can share with you. We already have our guest uh, who will be introduced in a bit. We're starting with the Punch newspapers. Uh, we'll be on your screen in just a few seconds. Um, and of course, uh, you get to see the big ones. Yes, it says there, military onslaught in Zamfara. Dislodged bandits flee southwards. Gunmen strike in Kogi, Kaduna, Ikiti. It says, we've got intelligence reports that bandits were coming to Ondo Forest. A Motekun Corps uh, commander says, also terrorists in, um, invade Kogi prison, free 240 prisoners, kill two soldiers, and gunmen abduct four AKT travelers. Also on the punch, four dead, 166 houses destroyed in Abuja estate flawed. Indigenous nationalities demand referendum as UN protest starts today. APC State Congresses hold uh, October 2nd. Also this morning, EFCC raids Ogun Government Hotel and others harboring fraudsters arrest 56. Federal government warns against fake vaccine card sale, justifies compulsory vaccination. Still on the punch, VAT judgment, FIRS may lose 92 billion Naira revenue to states. And another strike looms, ASU warns. NARD wants Buhari to lead talks. Falano heads legal team. Finally, non-oil exports. Federal government suffers 5.8 trillion naira revenue shortfall. On the Nation newspaper, panic in FCT, Kwara Ikiti. Over 240 fleeing inmates. Gunmen kill soldier, policeman in Kogi prison attack. 75 Zamfara pupils freed, striking doctors disown NMA over Buhari meeting. ICPC invites XIG, DG, budget, others. Police trust fund on the probe. IPOB stops pupils from sitting WASSCE exams in Southeast. APC State Congress holds October 2nd. Fitch upgrades Lagos government to AAA rating. Appeal court president. Judges pay poor judiciary underfunded. COVID-19, 25 dead in Lagos in three days, four passengers kidnapped in Ekiti. And lastly, on the Nation newspaper, four die, six vehicles swept away in Abuja flood. All right. The Daily Independent coming up uh, next. It says, despite headwinds insurance, uh, that's what headwinds insurance premium may hit one trillion naira in 2021. COVID-19 has come to stay. We must live with it, says the federal government says vaccine delivery would hit uh, 52 million doses by quarter two of 2022. Appeals to striking doctors to suspend action. I am loyal to Obasaki, but there are issues in Edo PDP, says Deputy Governor. Conduct of politicians, judges, and lawyers worrisome, NBA laments. Insecurity chief of army staff warns commanders against excuses. And uh, we can also find here, Abia government devises measures to stop sit-at-home compliance. Inugu residents lament sit-at-home. Flood kills four, sweeps 20, 26 vehicles, destroys 166 houses in Abuja. Uh, one or two others, uh, bandits invade military base in Zamfara, kill 12. And gunmen attack Kogi prisons, kill policemen, soldier, free 224 inmates. Those are the big stories on the Daily Independent. All right. Um, I think we can look at those stories this morning and say hello to our guest, Mr. Chris Wander. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So um, I want us to begin with the good news we're seeing across the papers. And we've seen that on uh, the Punch newspaper. And we've also seen that on the Nation newspaper, Zanfra Pupil's Freed, and also on the Daily Independent newspaper. And um, it's a story of 70, um, 70 or I beg your pardon, 75 Zanfra pupils freed. Um, the Belus, um, Zanfra state governor, Belu Metawali, announced this on Monday that, you know, it's been a while, um, back and forth negotiations, um, trying to make sure that these students are released and that finally um, that they have been rescued with the help of some gunmen who had repented. Um, what do you think about the story? 
Well, that's good news, and uh, we want more of that. Um, but in as much as we're celebrating that, don't forget that the onslaught is also ongoing. Um, the bandits in Zampara and other neighboring states are still digging in and um, kidnapping so many other Nigerians. Um, so many of these um, kidnappings and abductions are not reported. So it's only the high-profile ones that you get to read about or hear about. But um, mm -hmm. I can tell you that um, there's a lot, a lot of um, kidnapping um, going up in that as it's but good enough that um, this issue of some of the students uh, that were kidnapped have been released. Um, the last report we had was that um, this year alone, over 1,000, more than 1,000, can't even go 1,000, over 1,000 students have been kidnapped across the north. Uh, don't forget what happened in Niger State, Zamfara, Kalsina, and so many of the other states within the north. And um, that in itself is um, a big challenge to the go back to school um, uh, uh, attempts um, to make sure that student um, pupils in the north um, get the basic education. When you look at in terms of um, the problem we have with the Majoris, where everywhere in the north, so many um, children out of school, and the few ones that are um, going to school are being kidnapped and abducted on a daily basis, including in, in Kaduna, mm -hmm. where I don't expect it to happen. But uh, good enough, I hope that this will propel the uh, security agencies to also try as much as possible to rescue other uh, school pupils who are still a, a, a within the hoods of the bandits and um, terrorists, as I call them. Uh, I don't like calling using that word right. bandits, terrorists. Uh, we are just uh, rising this area and okay. kidnapping people for ransom. Now, let's move to the southeast. Uh, one of the things that we had already spoken about this morning, um, it's uh, on the Daily Independent, the Abia state governor, it's at the bottom left of the screen, it says Abia government devises measures to stop sit-at-home um, order, uh, or rather compliance, and it says also Enugu residents uh, uh, lament sit-at-home. Um, if you're also aware, this week, apparently there's been uh, uh, more days added to the sit-at-home Tuesday for Biafra, um, you know, members' uh, remembrance, those who were killed uh, in the attack at Namdekano's residence. And on Friday, another sit at home for, uh, well, because of Namdekano's trial. Um, so now I, I want your thoughts on the relevance of the Abia state government's move and also Governor Willie Obiano of Anambra State, who was walking around yesterday trying to encourage people to come out. Um, share your thoughts on that. You know, we discuss, we're discuss discussing this for over three, four weeks now, on a, uh, every Tuesday, on the issue of sit home. Sit at home or sit to whatever you call it in the southeast. And um, uh, my take has always been that the um, the leaders of the southeast are not doing enough, especially the governors. They are not doing enough to assure the people uh, of the safety of their lives. And that is why they are sitting at home. I've always said it. It's not because most of them support um, IPOP or whoever is giving such instructions, but because of the fact that they, if they go out. Um, they are, the tendency is that uh, they will lose their lives or they'll be attacked. So because of that, they rather stay at home when they know that the government cannot protect them. So if the governors have decided to do what we have been advocating all this while, to be able to reassure the people and put all the necessary security measures in place to make sure that um, um, the people are uh, safe uh, or they feel safe enough, they will come out and do their businesses. And, uh, you know, as you rightly said, I mentioned uh, Governor Willow Biano uh, took the bull by the horn yesterday and went around um, Oka and some markets in Anambra State to assure people that their lives are safe, that they should go about their businesses. But whether people will hear to that is something I don't know about. But I, I've always had this, uh, just as I mentioned, one of my um, uh, social media handles this morning. I feel that the those of the South is my people, and I'm an Igbo man. Um, we don't seem to be politically matured enough, just like what um, those of the Southwest. I'll give you a clear uh, example. What is happening in the South is presently cannot happen in the Southwest. You cannot see the Southwest government uh, people shutting down the economy of the Southwest just because Sunday Buhu is being held in prison or is being held somewhere. You cannot see them doing that. That is one. You cannot also see a situation where uh, people... Uh, people of the South West will start going to schools, chasing away students um, um, who are writing their exams, or people from going to take exams at the reps of them. 
You are turning, they are, you are turning to uh, the, the southeast to another educational disadvantaged uh, place. You are turning the children of the southeast into a majorist. What you are not trying to do is not to scare the children from going to school. And once that happens, then there's going to be consequences and serious problems uh, in that. So I don't see that happening in the south. It's not only the number of Kano that is being uh, is an agitator. But Sunday Ibo is also in prison. But you don't see the people of the South is behaving the way some of uh, the way my people are behaving. And that is so I, I, I always say that we need to borrow a leaf from the people of the South. That I'm talking about Igbos or Southeast people now. You might see the you might say that the uh, there may be some level of difference between what is happening to people, but they are practically the same thing. They are both agitators and they've been arrested. And I have almost also seen situations where um, the Southeast um, leaders also coming out to be able to put in a word or two for um, Nam de Kalu to be able to make sure that this thing is resolved. You can see what is happening to Ibu. Clear leaders of the Southwest are trooping to Benin. Obas, the Obas have sent emissary. Even when former president have gone to Ben to, to Kotonu to see way of making sure that this guy is released. But the safety is not. But you can also jeopardize that. Uh, just to pass that with what happened in this case of Enam de Kalu, we had some of the leaders stuck at their neck and got their fingers burnt. If you remember what happened to Enina Abari. So if you understand one, so bet my own what is that we must not go this route. The economy of the South is, is going down on a daily basis, and that doesn't seem to. So the governors should come out and make sure that they assure the people of their safety so that they can go about their businesses without any harassment. And security agencies to be able to take the initiative at this time also to be able to make sure that people's lives and properties are protected. Okay. Um, on the front page of the Punch newspaper, there's a story here on the VAT's judgment. It says FIRS may lose 92 billion naira revenue to states. And when we take a swipe on the leadership newspaper, and we see that it's the headlines there on the leadership. It says VAT battle shifts to National Assembly as lawmakers resume today. Umahi opposes collection by states and uh, fear grips FIRS tax consultants. So in this story on the leadership, basically, um, it's saying that, you know, the lawmakers have resumed after their two-month recess and that they will be talking about, you know, this matter because the FIRS had gone to the Constitution Amendment Committee of the National Assembly headed by Senator Ovio Magege, asking it to basically, you know, find out what they would decide on this matter. Who would collect, you know, the VAT, the states or the FIRS? So as the lawmakers begin to debate on this matter, what factors would you want them to consider? Well, good enough it is a constitutional matter, uh, as rightly said. And um, the lawmakers um, are there to make laws, and where they see where it's necessary to amend some, they also do that. But basically, as it were presently, based on what the courts have said, it is the right of the, the states have the right to do what they are doing. Um, it, it is um, it is not uh, within the purpose of the federal government or whatever federal agencies to collect VAT um, from states. And a court in um, River State have already ruled about, uh, on that. Um, a law has been passed in River State. Even uh, last week, the governor of Lagos State have signed the Lagos State VAT, VAT law into law. And um, that is what it is. And um, so, good enough, it is for the FRS to appeal, which I think, that, I think they are appealing already, going to the court of appeal, uh, where an injunction was uh, given by the uh, the, um, the, the court of appeal um, for the status quo to remain. But that to me is um, what we start seeing is what we call soft tool restructuring. Uh, these are some of the fundamentals that uh, people have been, talk been talking about over the years that the way Nigerian system is structured now is not working and there's a need for us to restructure. But the same National Assembly, we're supposed to start this debate or start um, making this necessary restructuring and not um, doing enough. And they've lost the trust of both the state and the people they are representing. So, which is why the states are not taking uh, the are, are taking the initiative. Not only that, don't forget that the stamp duty states are already started talking about the stamp duty, and they are ready to go to court on that. Um, so, um, let's see what the national assembly will come out to. But uh, it, it, let us even take it a, a little further. Uh, we can also be very creative with this, and this is where I think that um, FRS can be creative. Even if the state decides that it is decided that the states have the right to collect their VAT, 
the federal uh, FRS can also be more creative about it because they can collect on behalf of the states. And at the end of it all, and still get their four percent. Don't forget that whatever what goes to FRS is just four percent. So they can help the states to collect and still take their get their four percent. Because you know why? Most of the states don't have all the necessary statistics. They don't have the database to be able to effectively collect these stars like the Federal Inland Revenue Service. They already have a data that can be that can use. So even if at the end of it all, the court still rules that the states have the right to this, but the FRS still can be still more initiative and still get what they are getting. All they need to do is help the state collect this side and still get their four percent, even this time around, directly from source and disburse back to the state. If you understand what I'm trying to say. So they've not lost anything because FRS is only getting so that's the mistake most people have believed. They think that mm. FRS gets everything. FRS does not get anything. What FRS gets is just about four percent of that VAT. And which is why you see at the end of it all, they still disburse this money back to the states based on certain yeah. sharing uh, uh, formula. So, well, but what is this? We are not getting enough from the VAT as we're supposed to be, and which is why they're going about this um, state VAT laws. Yeah, still on this, I, I want you to go on ahead and share your thoughts on um, the, the governor of Ebony State, David Omahi, who is speaking against uh, this move by states to, of course, uh, collect their value added tax. Um, you know, earlier, I think sometime late last week, we had spoken extensively about how this uh, might affect states across the nation, uh, more than 30 states that will be affected if this eventually comes to pass. Um, and so do you think that's where Dave Umahi is speaking from, or is it really just, you know, a, you know, a support for the presidency that is driving his uh, narrative? Dave Umahi is the governor of the state. He can only speak for the state and not for Nigeria. This, all the governors have a right um, to determine how they rule their state. If he feels that the FRS should be collecting for his state, all well and good. They no, no, he, he's that. saying, but, I think he's speaking against states collecting their um, um, of VAT being paid to states. Um, basically speaking in support of the FRS um, and you know, asking that it remains that is, the way it is. Yeah, that is, why, that is where I'm going to. That's what I'm saying. His support of um, FRS and the collecting of uh, what I'm saying in essence is that if the states, every state has a right to determine how um, the governor or whatever leaders can rule their state or be able to preside over their state. So, and the governors have come to see a, 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 a loophole in that tax law and have gone into the, From what I've learned, um, I learned that there is no, nothing in the constitution of Nigeria which give um, FRS the right to collect. It was silent. Probably the, those that drafted the constitution in 1999 didn't ever say that. VAT is going to be a very, very big avenue for um, for revenue collection and rest of them. If you understand what I'm saying, so they were everybody were probably looking at oil, 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 which was why they did so much emphasis on oil. But now they've we've taken it to a higher, and VAT is becoming a very, very a, a very, very big factor in revenue. And let me say this: whether 30 states are going to die or not, it depends on the creativity of the government. There is no state in this country that does not have resources that they can use and push to drive revenue in their states. There's never one single state. Most of them, you can say that, oh, okay, most of these um, issues on the exclusive list and the rest of them, which also where we're talking about the issue of restoration, where states can, should be allowed to be able to tap in into the resources within their states and not pay something back. That happened in the First Republic, and that was how the, uh, in the Eastern region, the Western region, the Northern regions, and the rest. If you remember the days of the, um, um, uh, what is it, Ganot Pyramid, the days of cocoa in the, in, in the South, the days of um, coal in the East and the rest of them. That was how, what happened was that within that, within the regions, the regions we are, we are allowed to be able to harness the resources within their, uh, within their region and pay back, a pay certain percentage to the federal government. The way we are well structured now, the federal government is too big, it's too much a, a, an elephant in a room. About 51, 50 to 51 percent of the uh, revenue, uh, accredited revenue to Nigeria goes to the federal government, whereas 774 local governments and 30 states, 36 states, including FCT, just have just barely about 48 percent to uh, to share among themselves. That is is, uh, is is not good enough. So I believe that if we are starting looking at this issue of restructuring, where states can be allowed. Let me give a practical example. A state like Ogi State have no reason to go to the federal to collect anything. 
Kogi State is so rich in mineral resources that whatever is coming from Kogi State can be able to effectively um, take care of that state. Other some of states in the north as well, agriculture, Benue State. Benue State can fill half the whole of West Africa if they are very, very, if they are very creative. Gombe State, is it Gombe or which of one of the KB State or Hyderabad? that was having a handshake with Lagos State in the production of rice. I'm sure you must have agreed. You still remember that, that at a point that Lagos was invested in, I think it's KP, and every, every month you see rice being shipped to Lagos. So what I'm saying is that there is no state in Nigeria that cannot survive. The problem we have is that every month our governors are so lazy that they send their finance commissioners to Abuja to come and share out of the revenues coming out of the federal. And once they collect that, they just go back to their state and, and sit back. Lagos State was deprived of its uh, um, of its share of the uh, federal allocations. He forgot in during the Obasanjo job yes. um, uh, time. And that was why Lagos State came up, became so creative that for months, they did not depend. They didn't even wait on the federal government again to that. That was how Lagos started, IG and started rising. So I believe that when it comes to a point where certain people or certain states are pushed to the wall, they'll become creative. But the okay. way it is structured now, we are not getting it All right. right. Mr. Wando, I want us to um, quickly take a look at the stories of two strikes in Nigeria. First of all, it's the one with the um, NERD, the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors. So they're basically criticizing the NMA and the presidency for having meetings behind their back, as you've said it. Now, um, Vice President of NAD said, quote, um, how can you say you're having dialogue with people who are not concerned? Um, we're the ones having the issues that you're meant to meet with us. And that's because uh, NAD and the NMA and the president uh, met. And, you know, the NMA is now coming back to the NERD to ask them to call off the strike. But the NERD is complaining that they're being sidelined in the conversation. Um, also, um, talking about the, um, the strike with ASU, so the Academic Staff Union of Universities insists that the federal government actually has the money to pay the revitalization funds of about 40 billion naira, I believe, and that the federal government has just chosen not to do so. And they're asking the government to go back and implement the MOU that they signed December 20th, 2020. Please, let's have your comments on these two stories. If what Nad is saying is, is the truth, then that's a stab on the back by NMA. Don't forget, NMA is not on strike. It's Nad that is on strike. So if there's going to be any negotiation, it's going to be the federal government and Nad. NMA can only come in as an observer and cannot be the people that are going to go for negotiation. NMA has nothing at stake here. It is Nad that initiated it. Don't forget that NMA, NMA last week issued a warning to the federal government that if the discussion with NAD doesn't go proper, go out well as planned, that they will join the strike. So NME has not joined the strike. It is a, a National Association of Resident Doctors that's on strike. So if there's going to be any kind of negotiation, then the negotiation should be between NAD and the federal government. And NME can only be um, invited as an observer. And they are not going to be the one to negotiate for NAD. So, um, I think that the government is just trying to pay politics and try to break the ranks of the doctors. They'll be foolish enough if the if NMA should be allowing itself to be used against the resident doctors for the uh, for their demands, which to me is legitimate enough. Um, but NMA should be very very careful. They should, should be very careful. Government um, anywhere, especially in Nigeria, you don't trust government because whatever agreement you sign with government today. They will relate on it. And that takes me to what um, Asu is saying. Don't forget that was, uh, Asu was on strike for practically one, one year. And at the end of it, they reached a, 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 an agreement with the federal government. It was signed, sealed, and delivered, as they say, in law. But at the end of it, all, you could see that um, um, the, the, the federal government have been able to have reneged on that agreement, which is now prompting Asu saying that, oh, we have made, we have resume our strike. The same thing with Asu. People, people have already forgetting the one that they reached with the um, Agreement Union of uh, Polytechnic Electors or whatever uh, um, uh, they are called. That also has been, and there have been so that has been system within the government that they go into making promise at the end of it or sign agreements, but they don't live by that agreement. When you call out a strike, they quickly rush to the industrial court to get an injunction to stop that. I think we should stop all this, all this kind of this charades that are happening here and there. Uh, our government should be should be trusted. Any government that's short of trust 
with the people, then the legitimacy of that government is in question. Oh. And we always be in question. So um, I think that uh, my ICT advised that NMA should just softly, NAD should be carried along. At the end of it all, it is not NAD that is wearing the shoe and they know where it pitches them. Oh, so in agreement with, with NMA with that NAD being carried out of them, that may not work. All right, Mr. Wanda, quickly also speak on the security challenges, the attack on the army base in uh, Zamfara. It's it reports that 12 uh, people were killed, 12 soldiers apparently were killed. And um, also the uh, Kogi prison break, where more than 240 inmates um, we are reported to have um, been set free um, in Kogi state. Yes, let me start with the Kogi prison break. Uh, it's just unfortunate that we have been having a sent uh, jail break. And it seems that um, the the Ministry of Interior doesn't seem to be getting us together, as well as the um, the prisons. Uh, um, I, I I I passed through where that prison is. I passed through the uh, towards the last week. I'm away from Abuja, and um, I came by road you know, for certain reasons. And I saw where that. Immediately I saw that that was my first time of seeing that prison. Immediately I saw that where that prison was. I knew there's going to be issue. As if I was a prophet, and I said within my. Uh, mind that this place is so prone to attack. That prison is on the Obajana, if you know Kogi State very well, Obajana Kaba, um, it, um, that road. is on that express where you have Dangote's men. After that, it is just in an isolated place, nothing. Nothing that, the, where it is, and when I passed, I didn't see some kind of, the kind of security that you expect to see uh, in front of a prison and the rest of them. So the place is so isolated that it is very prone to attack. You need to see the world. I've seen several prisons. I've seen the Kuyu prison. I've seen Kirikiri prison and the rest of them. If you see the wall of that prison, it's so low that anybody can, an ordinary person can easily climb that place and jump over. So I, I don't think that the prison authorities are doing really, really the need for in some of these places. Maybe they took people for granted. That is the wall. I'm sure that is the wall of that prison. You can see how, how small that wall is. If you are anybody, nobody can be able to climb the Ikoyi prison wall or Krikri prison wall, and it is too, it's too, it's too low. So I think uh, we should put all the necessary security in place so that we don't continue to have this kind of jailbreak. Uh, one happened during SARS, it happened in uh, in Oweri. We've seen in Edo, um, Kogi has been very consistent in Lokoja and Nakaba. I think um, the authorities um, should be able to make sure that enough security is put in place and they should be able to raise those walls prevent uh, for the attack, for the uh, uh, military attack in Zamfara. I don't know whether the issue of cutting off of uh, network services is helping the issue of security in Zamfara. In my personal opinion, I don't know how the military will be able to communicate, our security agents will be able to communicate within themselves and be able to need most of the security. They said they have um, other uh, mechanisms they are using. But my problem is that if you cut off a network, um, telecommunications, telecommunications services because we want to cut off the bandits. What of the soldiers on ground? What of the policemen on ground? What of the GSS on ground? How will they communicate within themselves if somebody is in a far away 30, 50, 100 kilometers away from where you are? How do you communicate? How do you be able to mobilize your, uh, your, your troops to be able to? I, I, it's my personal opinion. I'm not a security expert. But my opinion is that probably this issue of cutting off network and the rest of them might not be working. It may have a retrogressive effect on us, our security architecture. But they know better, but, uh, but I still feel that um, we should try to prevent some of this. There was an attack at NDA. Uh, don't forget that also we are still having a major that was kidnapped and abducted. We've gone to sleep with that. Nobody has said anything thereafter. I don't think that young man has been rescued. And I don't know what effort the security agency, especially in Nigeria, is making to make sure that that young man is safe. And that is where we find ourselves, insecurity everywhere, all part of the country. And who do we blame? If we blame the president, the same people say that we are not being, uh, we are not being careful enough in the way we blame the president. But the box stop on is stable. Is Mr. Wandu, yes, Mr. Wandu, that's a good place to live it this morning. Thank you very much for joining us on Off the Press. Uh, we appreciate your analysis as always. Thank you very much for having me and do have a nice day. All right. And I'll be going to the year 2015 for Today in History to tell you about a situation that we've seen, you know, too many times in the U.S. And it's about racial uh, profiling and discrimination. All right. And going still in the United States to the year 1901 to tell you about the 25th American president.
And that comes up after the short break here on The Breakfast. Thank <laughs> you.